Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sylwia Spurak and I am MEP from Poland, co-reporter of the dossier on gender-based cyber violence in the European Parliament, but also attorney at law, activist and women's rights defender engaged in combating gender-based violence for over 20 years. I have a great honor to welcome all of you, honorable speakers and participants for cyber stalkers and perpetuating it to learn or to socialize, there is an urgency for this online violence to be addressed. The online world is as much of a public world. We all agree that we should not accept online what we cannot accept. Some feel too little is being done. In the EU Gender Equality Strategy 2020, we underlined that illegal online content targeting women is a scourge and that forward. Last week, we marked the 10th anniversary of the existence of a legal framework. This is a proposal will have the same objectives as the Istanbul Convention, protect the victims, prosecute the perpetrator. Also, be, before the end of the, of the year, the Commission will propose to create a new team. The Commission began talks with... Offline and online is the most severe form of gender. It has a structural nature and is one of the principal role which play women society. It is the same in domestic violence, sexual violence, in any other type of psychological, physical, and now also in violence online the root causes of all which address them holistically. It is important to acknowledge that as the European Union, we have failed so far in preventing and combating gender-based violence. In the 21st century, women and girls experience violence every day. We do not feel safe at homes, we do not feel safe when going out uh, in public places, and now we do not feel safe even in internet. One third of all women in Europe have experienced violence at least once since the age of 15. 52% uh, of women and girls have experienced some form of online abuse since the pandemic started. 87% said they think that the problem was getting worse and they were right. It is getting worse. Women experience cyber violence that is perpetrated by ex-husbands, ex-partners uh, as a continuation of domestic violence by persons they do not know or by anonymous abusers. All these behaviors have common goal to punish, to control, to silence women. Existing forms of gender-based cyber violence are constantly evolving and new forms are emerging. As the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women noted, every new technology can give rise to different and new manifestations of online gender-based violence. Simply saying, uh, where, wherever we go, whatever new digital space we develop, gender-based violence is suddenly here. Do we need a better argument that it is necessary to fight its root causes? Yet currently there is no specific instrument at the EU level directly addressing neither gender-based cyber violence nor gender-based violence as such. And there is a wide range of approaches to dealing with gender-based cyber violence in member states, mostly insufficient. In the majority of them, legislation doesn't provide provisions which would make specific reference to cyber or gender dimension of this type of crimes. Besides this lack of harmonized definition and common approach, other problems and challenges are, as Madam Commissioner said, under reporting, limited public and law enforcement awareness, insufficient victim support, limited research and knowledge, the question asked also in the title of today's event is what the EU could and should do about it. My answer is straightforward and clear. 
Firstly, ratify the Istanbul Convention, which I call a constitution of, of the rights of victims of gender-based violence. Secondly, adopt a comprehensive directive on preventing and combating gender-based violence in all its forms, including cyber violence. It is important to stress that these two calls are not opposing alternatives, but they complement each other and should be adopted by the EU in parallel. Uh, I have pointed that with proposing the measures which could and should be taken by the EU in an, a comprehensive letter to the President of the European Commission, Madame Ursula von der Leyen, in November 2020. The letter was co-signed not only by 74 MEPs, but also by almost 60,000 people from, from all over Poland who all believe that the problem is urgent and hope that the European Commission will show the highest determination to end it. The answer of Ursula von der Leyen for this letter was far from satisfactory. And coming back to Istanbul Convention, why the ratification of the convention is blocked by the Council and in the Council, uh, the EU should not just wait because every day of waiting brings new victims of gender-based violence. We must immediately adopt a directive with the measures at least as in the Istanbul Convention. It should address women in all their diversity as well as non-binary people. And I know we have an ally in you, Madam Commissioner, uh, in this regard specifically refer to online gender-based violence and its specific nature. Focus on victims with intersectional approach to the discrimination they face. For such legis legislation to be adopted, we need Article 83 of the treaty to be amended. So it lists gender-based violence as a type of EU crime. This is my persistent call, and this is also a call of Green's EFA group in our, our campaign and in our work in the European Parliament. I need to stress that these rather simple legislative solutions have been surprisingly difficult to implement for years. And I keep asking question, how is that possible? How it is possible that in the European Union in 2021, Gender-based violence is not only experienced every day, but is actually on the rise and it manifests itself in new forms, which we will discuss here today. Why the constant violation of the most fundamental right to live in safety from violence is not the number one issue discussed every day and everywhere, just as it happens every day and everywhere. Our immediate response to the COVID-19 pandemic proves that as the EU, we are capable of acting in the state of emergency. I had a dream that we would finally eliminate the pandemic of gender-based violence, both offline and online. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, and uh, this is uh, my turn. Uh, my name is uh, Anna Błaszczak Banasiak, and uh, I'm the head of office of uh, MEP uh, Sylvia Spurek. And it is my great, uh, great pleasure and honor to moderate today's extremely interesting uh, uh, panel with such wonderful uh, guests uh, who are uh, Mrs. Asha Allen, representing, representing the European Women's Lobby. Asha uh, coordinates their uh, specific areas of the broader work on eradicating all forms of violence against women, specifically coordinating Her Net, Her Rights project, which maps the prevalence of violence against uh, women in the digital space from a holistic uh, perspective. And then Mrs. Zuzanna Varso, a senior research analyst at uh, Trilateral uh, Research, 
co-author of a comprehensive report on cyber violence against uh, women published by the Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights. And last but not least, Mrs. Sei Akivowo, currently the founder and executive director of Glitch, the international recognized UK charity dedicated to ending online abuse and championing digital citizenship. And I'm really happy to, uh, to, to meet you today in such a good company. And uh, our idea uh, was to divide our discussion today into two rounds. First round, when I want to focus on different angles of the problems, um, its root causes and the drivers, and second round about the ideas and suggestions for solutions, particularly for uh, the EU uh, level. And unfortunately, we are a bit late. So without further delay, I would like to start our discussion with Mrs. Asha uh, Allen. Um, Asha, having regard uh, to the findings of her net, her rights project, which I already mentioned, and from the perspective of the current situation of COVID-19 pandemic, what can you tell us about the scale of uh, different forms uh, uh, and um, uh, particularities of gender-based uh, cyber violence? And I'm especially wondering, are we facing a parallel pandemic of gender-based violence online? Thank you for the question and uh, thank you to the invitation for joining today and uh, hello to everyone who's watching and hello to the sisters on the panel. It's good to see your faces again, as always. Um, so yes, in, in answer to your question, I think it's very interesting um, in relation to how this discussion is, is phrased as a parallel pandemic. We, we understand that during the, the height of the pandemic, which is still ongoing, of course, many of us are still experiencing lockdown and many women and girls are still in lockdown, um, that the experience is that, of course, there is an increase. Um, we rely heavily upon the, uh, the data that's being developed by organizations like Glitch and the wonderful research by Susanna um, to be able to tell us what is happening. And, and our Her Net Her Rights um, report did the same in 2017 as we tried to map the prevalence of the issue. So, but it's, it's interesting in that this, of course, predates the pandemic, of course, the, the, the reality of women and girls facing violence in all its forms predates that. And it, and it has been an almost shadow pandemic that's been going on the, the whole time. Um, and I was very pleased to hear in the, the opening uh, remarks in regards to how you know, online violence is being um, framed in this conversation from a very holistic perspective, because of course, there has been increasing discussion on sexist hate speech, but we really are talking about the manifestation of patriarchy in the online space. We're talking about doxing, sexual exploitation, sexual harassment, um, and the use of uh, digital tools to facilitate intimate partner violence and domestic violence. It really is about understanding that it is just another mechanism of perpetuating violence against women and girls. Um, and knowing that this is impacting on women in politics and racialized and minoritized groups more so, and that their experiences um, are, are much, much worse in those spaces. So indeed, I think we are facing an, an increasing situation and um, understanding that there is no longer a line or there never really has been a line between what is happening in the online and the offline space. But we definitely need to move beyond um, the discussions on, uh, on what we're dealing with what is the reality um because i think we we there's been a lot of acknowledgement thus far uh what's needed a lot more is a lot more data from across europe unfortunately not all european member states um have contributed to collecting data on um violence against women or specifically violence against women online um and we also need to ensure that any kind of measures that are taken are done from this intersectional holistic and very comprehensive and harmonized perspective because unfortunately the steps that we have seen are just unfortunately not fit for purpose so to give you an example we may have um laws in member states about image-based sexual abuse which is commonly referred to as revenge porn but the assumption here is that the crime is formulated in a gender neutral way so completely ignores the gender 
dimension of this uh, issue, but similarly assumes there's an existence of a prior relationship between the perpetrator and the victim, for example, whereas our research very clearly showed that there are thousands of websites dedicated to sharing non uh, images non-consensually. So the, the victim may not even know how many times um, this is being shared or how many perpetrators there actually are. So what we really tried to do with Her Net Her Rights was to, to bring a uh, a kind of context to what we were talking about um, and to identify where are the key areas that we need action and how quickly and urgently we need that action. Thank you very much, especially for, for uh, stressing this intersectionality perspective. We will come back to it later because I, I do believe that it's uh, uh, really important uh, but uh, right now, uh, my question to uh, Mrs. Zuzanna Varso. I uh, uh, remember that uh, when the report of Helsinki Foundation was published, it was promoted with a great video with Maria Kiris Kodowska, our great compatriot, uh, who, who posted a selfie made in the lab and receives lots of hateful comments which almost discourage her from, uh, from uh, further work. And using that example, could you elaborate on the gender-based perspective of cyber violence and what are the specific root causes and specific consequences of uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to this to this panel. It's a great honor to be here, and uh, and it's a pleasure also to see that the EU is uh, finally paying attention, more attention, uh, to the problem of violence against women, including cyber violence. And and thanks to the wonderful MEPs who are pushing this. Um, but coming back to your question, indeed, we, we chose to, to promote our report and our project with that video of Maria Skorowska Kiri. And we, uh, we chose the historical figure uh, in order to show exactly what has been already mentioned that, um, that the problem of cyber violence against women does not exist in a historical or, or social vacuum but it is uh, yet another manifestation of a, um, of a phenomenon that existed b before internet and, uh, and manifests uh, unequal power relations between uh, men and women, which uh, have led to the discrimination of women and, and prevented women from, uh, from realizing their full potential and advancement to quote the Istanbul Convention. And by the way, um, when we did our research, it turned out that Maria Skodowska Kiri was herself a victim of what we could uh, call uh, slut shaming because of her um, relationship after her her husband died. So, so that was um, that proven to us that it's a, it's a, it's an indeed uh, important point to make to show this this historical context and. Um, yeah, as, as I said, this this uh, phenomena of of uh, violence, uh, cyber violence against women, is 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 um, has shares many features with other forms of uh, violence against women, and we underlined that in our report. So, for example, similarly to um, sexual harassment at workplace, it's being trivialized and it's being treated as a, as a joke, as something uh, harmless, and we've seen how throughout the decades the, the the problem of sexual harassment at work at work has has been per perceived in that way and only after campaigning and after only after um uh, court cases it, it it became clear to everybody hopefully that it's not a normal abuse. uh and similarly to for example the domestic violence um, violence online is also treated as something that uh, that is private that is that does not uh, require the attention and, and, and action of the public authorities. So, so there are many different, um, um, so there are different features that this, this form of violence against women shares with, with, uh, with other forms of violence. And uh, I know we are short on time, but I just want to 
go on and and say a bit more about the results we 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 have from our report because I think it's very important and and it and it in a way addresses the the, the criticism that we often hear that uh, everybody can can become a victim of of uh, cyberbullying or cyber harassment and indeed this is this is true um uh, but uh, what we have uh, seen in our research and uh, and i think it's obvious to everybody who who works with this topic that um that violence against that online violence against women has uh, has a very specific character it uh, very often um refers to women's sexual and and private life it it um uh, focuses on their bodies on their looks on, on their intimate relationships. So uh, again, this is this this clearly shows that this is uh, this is a, a symptom of a wider problem of perceiving women as uh, as having specific role in the society and in the family, the objectification of women. So uh, it's not it's 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 this gender dimension towards violence um, uh, against women is 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 crucial and um again going uh, going back to your question and and the consequences of of uh, violence against women our online our research has shown that there is this as as already has been mentioned spillover from uh, online to offline and in fact there is no um, no uh, clear line between these two spheres i think we all know that by now very well and and the covid pandemic has proven that uh, again um so these consequences take place both online and the impacts uh, are both online and offline so online women tend to for example self censor or think twice about what they post or in most extreme cases, even refrain from being active in the public sphere, which uh, which um, has a terrible uh, effect on on public debate, on democracy. Even uh, even um, so, so in, in parallel to the individual impacts it has, it has an impact on the whole society, on on the level of our of our discussion, and 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 and, and next to this, these, there are consequences in the in the real life, so to say. So, um, without going too much into detail, there are all kinds of uh, of uh, you know emotional reactions. Uh, women um, said they would uh, they were forced to see uh, to see uh, mental to to see assistance from mental health professionals. Or even they change their um, everyday everyday um, routines because they felt threatened. So I think it's it's really important to, to to know that this is not something that happens only online. That it's not something which is a joke, which can be trivialized and disregarded. But it's a as a face of a very deeply rooted problem we are dealing with in our societies and has to be addressed. Uh, very urgently because it, because it prevents people from living uh, living their life and uh, and achieving what they are uh, capable of of achieving. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think it is particularly important to point out that victims really feel ignored and. Also, that's why the action by public actors, including the EU institutions, is really necessary to break down uh, this resistance. Uh, but you know, just imagine how happy uh, 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 Maria Curie-Skłodowska was without all this hate on uh, social uh, uh, media. But uh, 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 no, 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 no more, ki no more uh, uh, kidding. Uh, uh, say. Uh, I have a question, Kous. Uh, you state on your website and in your numerous speeches that uh, uh, to make the uh, online uh, space uh, safe for all, we must discuss uh, online abuse and its impact through an uh, uh, intersectional lens. And uh, could you discuss the scope and impact of gender-based cyber violence on individuals and society? Uh, from the intersectional perspective. Uh, what does research and statistics tell us about it? 
Thanks so much for having me. So I'm Shay, I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Glitch. Glitch is a small UK-based charity determined to make the online space safe uh, for all, but particularly women and girls, because sadly we know that women are disproportionately impacted by online abuse. We do that through campaigns, and we've done great campaigns with European Women's Lobby. It's really bad to be on a really great to be on a panel with you again, Aisha. Um, we've also uh, do a lot of work with tech companies and governments around systemic change. So I'm really pleased to be having this conversation on an EU level, and we deliver workshops, educational programs um, to help women at, the, at, at this moment feel safe. Uh, while calling for long-term systematic change. And I'm really pleased to say that today we have launched a new resource called Digital Threats to Democracy, which is supporting women in public life ahead of the local elections that we're having in the UK um, in May. And I'll pop a link um, so that it can be shared around. But that took us a long time to pull together the different ways in which women in public life are facing abuse and therefore how to mitigate it. And it's also infuriating because it's like, why do we even have to do this in the first place? It's like, let's take a moment to understand that this was a platform that was created not for women and it's now hurting women and we're now having to do extra work and the emotional labour to make the spaces safe. And I think that is why intersectionality is important. Intersectional framing allows us to see how compounding and intersecting identities display or create new forms of vulnerabilities, harassment, oppression. And the same way we applied intersectional lens uh, offline thanks to the work of um, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw and others, it allows us to see that the rolling of welfare benefits, for example, needs to be done through an intersectional way, so it's actually landing to the people that they want it to. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's important to understand how um, that plays out online. So the abuse that myself and Aisha would receive is going to be completely different to the abuse that you would receive, Anna, because we are black women. We would receive racism and sexism and the unique combination of the two called misogynoir, which was a term um, coined by Dr. Moya Bailey in the US. Intersectional intersectional framing make sure is allowing us to make sure the most vulnerable are safe and therefore everybody benefits from that. But we could not be calling the online safe space. So we cannot be calling the online space safe if we're not making sure that black women, um, our Muslim friends, our LGBT communities, our disabled women are not safe online. The benefit of intersectionality also allows us to see how it plays out, like I said before. We have heard through our workshops and our roundtables and conversations we've been having with our with different communities how online abuse um, 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 plays out. And that allows us to be better active bystanders to those communities because we're now spotting the impact and the abuse that they receive. So, for example, before this meeting last uh, October, I had no idea this was a, uh, 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 the case, but I found out that um, people with uh, epilepsy were targeted um, with abuse by the sending of flashing gifts and images to spark an epileptic attack. Now, I don't have epilepsy. No one in my family does. So I would, I would not know if somebody sent me a flashing gift, I'd be like, oh, that's annoying. But I would not have known what that, that impact can have. And then there's been... Um, uh, targeted trolling of epilepsy society groups here in the UK, where they are being sent these flashing images. They and what the impact of this has been when there when there are women taking um, picking up their kids from school, going to work, and they see their phone. They are faced with epileptic attacks before driving at school at uh, the school gates. It's having a knock on effect, which we don't often talk about because we're such in the fighting mode of online abuse. We don't actually talk about the the secondary and third. Uh, and fourth and fifth um, knock-on effects of online abuse. Um, and that's a, that's a really key example of where intersectionality really allows us to make to understand how these play out. We understand, um, intersectionality allows us to understand that dead naming won't affect me because I am a straight cis black woman, but a trans man or trans woman will face the repercussion of somebody trying to ex embarrass them or expose them or bring up their previous identity to try and cause some harm. It's important to understand that what dead naming is so that I can be uh, ally to them and not fall into the trap of what we're seeing at the moment, particularly with young people, is banter. Discarding and disregarding everything that's happening online as a bit of fun when actually it's having traumatic impact. And the last way that uh, intersectionality is important is that impact element. 
So I'm not, I'm from a quite a liberal Nigerian community, but I am one of few, <laughs> you know, Nigerians. We are very conservative. We are very good Christian girls. <laughs> we are not, I would not be allowed to be living in sin <laughs> at the moment with my boyfriend in lockdown, right? So, but that is a really important lens because lens because you've got really conservative, orthodox communities where girls are victims of um, the sharing of non-consensual photography in school. Um, there are they are they are victims of deep, deep fake that could cause real massive impact offline on certain conservative communities where we're just beginning to have a conversation around gender equity offline, let alone the online space. So intersectionality is so core and so complex, but that is why we need to be calling tech companies to have diverse groups of um, uh, diversity in their workplace, in senior management, in, in the enforcement of their policies, in the creation of their policy policies, how they work with civil society groups or who are from diverse groups. And it is possible because we have, me and Aisha have respectively hosted several round tables in the last two years with diverse groups of people. When we get, when we go to groups with, when we go to meetings with Facebook and Twitter and Google, we tend to be the only white person of difference there. We tend to be the only black women in the room. And I'm, I'm I don't want to say it's laziness, but I want to say there isn't a urgency or a put or encouragement or an incentive enough to do that extra work to get diversity in the room, which is why we need regulation, which is why we need tech regulation across nation countries. We're having a conversation here in the UK about the online harms bill and why we need it on an EU wide level. And we need to make sure the regulation has intersectionality and women at the focus. Sadly, in the UK, the online harms bill doesn't even mention women enough. And we're having to push for that, let alone pushing for intersectionality. So where Europe, I know the sore point the UK have left, but I know, but I, this is where Europe can really help push the UK who want to claim to be world, world class in, in legislation, in tech, well, you can show what world class actually looks like by including 50% of the population, which currently our bill doesn't do. So to, to, to wrap up, if the conversations around online abuse isn't done with an intersectional lens, I'm afraid the conversation isn't being had. It isn't being had about gender-based um, violence. And if we don't understand that the, there was already a deficit in this information of, of online abuse and, and, and gender-based violence before the pandemic, my gosh, it's only gotten worse in the pandemic. We launched a, we launched a survey with almost 500 people last year that showed that online abuse had increased by 38% during the pandemic. So people who had received online abuse before the pandemic have, have said that it's increased over the last 12 months. And then again, when you apply an intersectional lens, this increased for black and minoritized women and for non-binary people. So this was already a problem. We were talking about let's not be silenced before the pandemic. We were talking about this during the Me Too movement. And the pandemic has only exacerbated this and made this worse. The creation of algorithms, deep fakes, and, and the reliance from the because of the pandemic of, of content moderators on AI is only exacerbating gender-based violence. And the worst thing, I think um, men women would agree with me on this, many women would agree with me on this, is the gaslighting. You finally are able to get the energy to report the abuse to tech companies, report it to the platform, and then they tell you, this is not a violation of our platform, or uh, we, we can't see this being a, a, a real threat. Tell that to somebody who is facing uh, threats to their life, to their children, to their livelihood, that it's not a real threat. And I think that until we understand intersectionality, we have not begun to have a conversation around online abuse. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot. This is actually really uh, scared, and I'm afraid that so many women so uh, uh, really, really do understand what you are talking about. Uh, and I think we already have a pretty clear picture of the situation, but someone may say that uh, it is easy to complain. Uh, so uh, let's focus on our uh, solution. Uh, uh, so maybe I will start with uh, Zuzana this time. Because uh, the main question for today is how should the EU uh, prevent and combat gender-based violence online from a legal perspective? Uh, if and how uh, could the Istanbul Convention be a, a solution? And uh, uh, from a perspective uh, of a lawyer knowing very well the problem in a member state, could you mention where are the gaps which the EU legislation could fill in? 
thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, I think um, it is very important that we talk about regulation and that we turn to law as a as a source of of potential solutions. Um, I think we have this um, tendency. I mean, not we, but uh, people dealing with regulation of technology. This the, the, there's this the, there's this tendency to fear regulation when it comes to technology because it will stop the progress which honestly um, I, I very much disagree with. And I think we are, uh, we are, I think we are, we should be all fed up with this discussion about um, platform, platform self-regulating themselves and allowing tech companies to regulate themselves because otherwise um, something bad would happen. I think we need that, we need all the solutions that we talk about to be, uh, deeply rooted in, in, in hard law and, and, and binding uh, rules. Otherwise, we will not move forward. Um, as far as concrete steps that the EU should take um, are concerned, some of them have already been mentioned. So I just uh, want to briefly recap the, the, main, um, the main steps that I think are crucial. I think it's important to keep repeating them and then, and then give some examples of, of secondary legislation that um, that I find interesting and re relevant in this context. So as has already been said, I think it's crucial that, that there is progress as far as the accession to the Istanbul Convention is concerned. And when we talk about combating uh, cyber violence, uh, I think um, different measures that are aimed at combating uh, violence against women in general are relevant. So again, this online offline division is not very relevant here. But that being said, I think Istanbul Convention offers a great framework both to online and offline violence against women. So um, just a couple of provisions. So Article 17, which which uh, obliges parties to so member states in this uh, to to encourage private uh, companies, including those from tech sector, to participate in the development of policies and adopt and uh, apply the policies developed um, uh, by, by states to combat violence against women, then, uh, then the convention also uh, obliges parties to uh, adopt measures that would um, punish uh, different types of violence against women, including stalking and sexual harassment, which can take place online. And so Article 34 or Article 40. Um, and then I think it is important to reiterate what uh, what um, Dr. Spurek said. I think there is a this should go in line with with EU adopting uh, its own um, legal uh, instruments. So a directive that would um, that would um, provide this framework, this comprehensive framework to fight violence against women. And, and include violence against women as one of the so-called European crimes in Article 82. Um, so that being said, I will also like to um, give examples of, of, of instruments that we looked at and, 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 um, and tried to assess their um, efficiency, effectiveness uh, in terms of dealing with uh, violence against women in, in, uh, when it comes to secondary legislation. So, before moving on, I, I think there is a need to, for a um, comprehensive overview of secondary legislation, existing secondary legislation, and the and the gaps there are uh, in terms of of um, dealing with violence against women. So, as an example, uh, we looked at the directive on the implementation of the principle of equal treatment of um, men and women and access to goods and services. So just to just to upfront, I have to say that currently this directive does not apply to the content of media and advertising. So um, uh, it's out of question it being able to 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 be a, a solution. But that being said, there have been some very interesting discussions also in the European Parliament as regards the um, the liability of service providers 
when it comes to acts and, and sexual um, harassment committed by third parties. In fact, these discussions were, were um, th this has been raised not in relation to online spaces, but in uh, in relation to a collaborative economy and, and for example, uh, different types of transport. But the but the fact that the EU does not that the uh, EU law in in this case that the directive does not provide relevant um, uh, interpretation and, and and measures to address the the problem of the so called third party sexual harassers has been already raised. So again, it's not not something new. Um, uh, and and another measure I want to mention is the framework um, decision on um, on uh, fighting uh, racist and xenophobic uh, hate speech. So um, I think it's important to try to be um, creative and think a bit about uh, and think about this problem we are talking about from different perspectives. And uh, as already been said, that the, the violence, uh, the online violence against women, um, can be considered a form of hate speech. And I think it's important to to uh, keep that in mind because uh, in many in many countries, sex or gender are not listed as as the um, grounds uh, in the in the provisions uh, that that have to do with hate speech. So I think it's important we 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 try to extend this framework of of um, fighting and preventing hate speech also to include other grounds. And as has been already said, um, that the, the intersectional uh, aspect is is very crucial here. So it's not only gender, it's not only race, it's not only ethnicity, um, and and we, and and we should not be focusing on our own field, so to say, but think about the, the wider context in general. So that's it. Thank you. Anna, no, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, so, so continuing with this uh, uh, issue, Asha, uh, uh, may I ask you what are the uh, solutions that the uh, EU uh, should uh, implement now to uh, prevent and combat gender-based uh, cyber violence? And uh, what yours, I mean, the European uh, Women's Lobby uh, policy recommendation? Thank you. Um, and just to kind of pick up on the last points that were just made, I mean, for the European Women's Lobby, we've been in existence now for 31 years. Um, we're over 2,000 women's organizations. And for that entire time, alongside our Observatory on Violence Against Women, we've been asking for the same thing, which is a comprehensive framework and EU measures and measures in the member states to combat all forms of violence against women and girls. And of course, we've just adopted and adapted to reflect uh, contemporary context to include on all forms of online violence as well. But I think we need to be quite clear that, you know, that it's very, for us, the recommendations are, are quite solid and very in line with what Commissioner Dali and uh, Dr. Spirit were mentioning before in the need to accede to the Istanbul Convention without delay, the EU signed in 2017, and we have still not had them accede to the Istanbul Convention and neither have all member states though 21 have, have ratified and implemented the Istanbul Convention. Um, so that needs to be done um, immediately. And of course, we um, support your call, um, the European Greens and many other political parties in the European Parliament for a horizontal directive um, to combat gender-based violence against women, for that to be aligned with the standards of the Victims' Rights Directive and the standards of the Istanbul Convention. So as mentioned before, for those two processes to be um, done in parallel and within this um, directive for there to be online violence against women included. So those are, it's quite clear and I think this has been defined. It's been mentioned in the gender equality strategy. It's been mentioned in the recommendations of the European Parliament and it's, and it's very clear for us as well, we kind of addressed this um, a little bit further in a report that we're going to be launching tomorrow, actually, on the impact of the Istanbul Convention, its applicability and the positive impact it's had for women and girls in the countries where it's been applied. 
But I think what we need to ensure is that this doesn't get bogged down in political dialogue um, and get depoliticized as the process goes along. I mean, it's it's quite clear that what has been making this worse the, the whole time is this kind of either non-existence, inadequate or unharmonized legal frameworks that exist that don't speak to each other or don't adopt a, a perspective that includes uh, uh, women and girls. Just to go back to the points made by, by Shay and Susanna, um, similarly, the EU frameworks don't mention women and girls or sex and gender in any of their documents. So the Code of Conduct on Hate Speech um, in 2016, which is signed by some of the big tech companies, do not does not mention women or sexist hate speech at all. Neither does the framework decision either. So even at EU level, we do not have that recognition. And I think it would be in complete opposition to the commitments of the EU treaties and the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights for women and girls to be able to benefit to being protected online because of an arbitrary connection to a regulation on liability or something related to transport. That in itself uh, is, uh, to be quite frank, a little bit ridiculous in, in terms of that we need to have clear frameworks addressing the the abuse that women face online but all forms of violence against women and girls and for those commitments to be very very clear and not just be linked to this is happening and women get to benefit because of this other solution that we came up with that wasn't necessarily connected to it and you know urgent action is needed um, and is vital to ensure that all women and girls in all of their diversity can be safe online because the dependence of online tools and the online space is so clear that we mentioned before the Me Too movement and how much that was able to mobilize change, give women a voice, give them a space to be able to share their experiences safely. The need for anonymity for human women's human rights defenders in, in liberal governments and in liberal countries is so vital. We need to be having this nuanced discussion about what online regulation will look like um, and to make sure that the priority is uh, the safety of people who are engaging in that space. That has to be the utmost priority. And that's how the framework should be developed from that, that process. So just to kind of wrap up and to, and to clarify, I've, I've mentioned, of course, the what we would call for in our recommendations very clearly that directive and very clearly including violence against women. But just to aid the process, as it were, we would clearly say that um, online violence needs to be legally defined and could be legally defined as outlined by the UN Special Rapporteur in her report in 2018, where she clearly gave a definition that could be referred to and has been referred to by the European Court of Human Rights and has been referred to in other spaces. But similarly, that it could be seen as this kind of framework concept um, where very specific behaviors such as doxing, such as online um, stalking and sexual harassment are expressly criminalized because at this moment in time, none of these actions and perpetration of violence is criminalized. And it's very easy for to, it to get lost in the conversation about what's illegal content, what's harmful content. The moment we very clearly have that legal framework and that comprehensive legal framework criminalizing all forms of violence against women and girls online, we will have the clarity needed to make sure that the online space is clear and subject to the laws and legislation that gives women across Europe equal participation, because absolutely all women and girls in Europe deserve to live their lives free from every single form of violence that they may experience. Thanks a lot. And it is interesting that the Istanbul Convention returns once uh, again. Uh, I think it is also worth uh, mentioning that according uh, to the recent opinion of the Advocate General, unanim unanim unanimity will not be necessary in the Council to decide uh, on its ratification by, by the EU. We should uh, remember that. But uh, let's back to, to uh, say, uh, you state that uh, an essential solution to, to, to ending all forms uh, of uh, online abuse uh, is uh, digital citizenship. Could you explain, uh, explain this uh, concept focusing uh, both on our responsibility as digital citizens, but also on the role of institutional, uh, of institutions, sorry, uh, mostly the, the, the EU? 
Yeah, thank you. So digital citizenship has been a concept that has existed for a while, but we've taken it to another level in trying to um, have an online gender-based violence lens to it. I think digital citizenship before existed as a concept basically like media literacy, um, more around tackling extremism um, of one type, not all extremism, sadly. Um, and so what we try to do is evolve this as a concept to address the different types of online harms um, that we're seeing and potentially could see. And digital citizenship at its core is about having rights and responsibilities. The same way that we would have a right to go to school, a right to education, we are responsible. Maybe I should have been a bit more responsible back in <laughs> back in school and being more respectful to my teacher, but you get the point that it's about understanding that to keep something as a privilege, to keep something as, a, a, as special as a kind of social good, we have all a responsibility to, to, to play. And so uh, digital citizenship goes beyond what we have as media literacy or digital literacy, literacy education to talk about our um, civic responsibilities to each other. What does it look like to be an active bystander online? Digital self-defense, um, which looks at cyber security. So how you can make sure you've got the most optimal safety, but how you can make sure that you know how platform settings work so that you can have really good digital self-care self -care and navigate that online space. Um, and that looks like uh, education programs in schools for young people, which we've delivered. That looks like active bystander interventions for specific communities. So on the back of Black Lives Matter last year, we did a new toolkit um, for how to stay, how to be an ally to Black women online, and how to specifically help help over 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 power the levels of abuse that Black women disproportionately receive. Which we know through Amnesty International's research that Black women are eighty. Uh, four percent more likely to be to face harassment online than white women. Um, digital citizenship for uh, uh, for individuals also looks at, um, uh, uh, as I said, personal security, the security of others. But it also looks at like what tech accountability is. So the same way we had, we've been calling for years, and it could always be better political education in school so that every citizen, every young person was really aware of their civic duties once they turn for, the, for us in the UK 18, how to hold parliament to account, what the council did, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We're calling for that same thing to happen when it comes to the tech space. This murkiness, this grey this gray area, this, this understanding, this need to have we're talking in WhatsApp groups to be able to know what, what's happening in tech companies. So me and Aisha are consistently asking, messaging each other like, what does this mean? What's this new reforming? Do we like this reforming? We're having to pull together our already limited resources to try and understand tech companies. This shouldn't be something that only a privileged few in civil society understand. This should be something that is public knowledge because the online space is an extension of our public spaces. Um, and so what we ask of institutions, both government and tech companies in turn, government to be fostering and, and, and supporting digital citizenship education. So it's not just available in schools and colleges, but it's available in libraries. Like I have a massive vision to see digital citizenship quizzes and pamphlets and education, the way we've been seeing wash your hands, like the way we've been seeing wash it, dry it, scrub it, you know, all of the, all of the stats, oh, sorry, all of the campaign um, uh, phrases to get us to be understanding that we're all in this kind of pandemic together. We all need to be safe or safe for, for the pandemic. I envision seeing that when it comes to digital citizenship, that we have pop-ups at um, bus stations that show three ways you can be a digital citizen. We have, when you are signing up to the internet and borrowing kind of public, um, um, Wi-Fi, you know, at libraries or, you know, your local coffee shop, alongside it asking you to basically give away all of your data and they can sell it onto third parties. Why aren't they asking us or prompting us to be digital citizens as we're using their Wi-Fi? Like, I really see this being about government fostering brands, employers, uh, institutions in, 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 in each country to be able to, 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 to encourage this. And then for tech companies, tech companies specifically, it's in two folds. It's one, making sure that their platforms um, meet this digital citizenship standard. And that's something that we are working on and hope to be able to work with um, partners like you, definitely, to understand, do, are tech companies meeting this standard of digital citizenship? Are they meeting the standard of what we expect in content moderation, what we expect when it comes to policies? And then um, we also want tech companies to be 
supporting digital citizenship. So nudging people to kind of um, um, prompts, uh, investing in their safety tools so that you can have more agency over your uh, over your platform, that you can, it, it makes it easier to do bystander reporting as well. There are many things that institutions can do to support us de demonstrating more positive um, and engaging behavior because at the moment the stats are showing that people see abuse but just scroll and ignore it. We wouldn't do that offline. We wouldn't see somebody, a woman screaming for help, a woman's been sexually assaulted and we would just ignore it. We would just tell her, oh, maybe you should pull your skirt down or maybe you should just, um, you know, uh, block them. Maybe you should just not walk down that street. We wouldn't say these things offline but yet we're saying it online yet we're allowing tech companies to implicitly say this online and digital citizenship is about challenge that challenging that perfect thank you so much uh, for your uh, contribution and uh, uh, this is the the moment to uh, to uh, to give our viewers a voice uh, you can ask the question uh, as a comment on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube. And actually, I already a uh, good uh, uh, one. Uh, there is currently Digital Service Act being negotiated uh, that will lay down the ground rules for the platforms to operate, including dealing with illegal and harmful content. How can we make sure that the DSA protects victims of online violence and improves the way how cases of online violence are handled? Who uh, wants to uh, comment this uh, uh, question? Maybe, uh, uh, maybe Asha, yes, please start. Sure, I'd be happy to. As a uh... The, the Digital Services Act and the development of the Digital Services Act is one of the, the spaces that EWL um, have contributed from a consultative uh, capacity in, in terms of what the, the Commission has opened up. And for us, it's very, very clear that the Digital Services Act in itself, for those of us who are familiar with it, but for those of us who are not, is a huge uh, proposal trying to govern essentially much of the online space, as it were, from competition to fundamental rights um, online. And so for us, it's, it's very ambitious, but what we want to ensure is that there is a framework specifically addressing violence against women and girls. So the directive that you are putting forward um, and, and that we would also support and have been advocating for, and that these pieces are aligned. It's very clear that at this moment in time that the different pieces that already exist, whether it's the EU signature to the Istanbul Convention, the Victims Rights Directive, um, and the other directives and framework decisions that we have, without this alignment, we will not be able to achieve the holistic intersectional perspective that we've been talking about for the last 90 minutes. Um, it just it just won't be possible to achieve. So the Digital Services Act is actually a really key opportunity um, and it has committed at its heart that fundamental rights um, will be part of it and will be one of the three key driving factors behind it. So in order to ensure that that is the case, it needs to be developed in a partnership with civil society and with the experts who can, you know, kind of explain in detail the experiences of women and girls online from that intersectional perspective, but that there is this opportunity. The Digital Services Act proposal was presented this year, and we heard from Commissioner Dali, uh, Dali earlier that there may be a proposal at the end of this year regarding uh, violence against women, ensuring that those timelines, it's, it's too opportune of a moment, ensuring those timelines are aligned and that those pieces are very clearly aligned um, and that they speak to each other explicitly, not only in what they're proposing from a legislative point of view, but in terms of their implementation and their monitoring, making sure that those experts who are monitoring the implementation of these frameworks include civil society experts as well, is essential. So the key word here for me would be harmonization, um, but also nuance. Um, and also effective implementation. Thanks a lot. That's a very comprehensive, comprehensive answer. Uh, but maybe, uh, Susanna, do you, uh, would you like to add something on the DSA issue? Um, I, I totally agree with all of what, uh, what has been said. One thing that I find very important is the uh, is making sure that there are uh, proper procedural guarantees when it comes to uh, these processes that are, are put forward and proposed. 
uh, what we are having, what we what we have now is 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 again a quite um, unclear when it comes to the concrete steps that the that the tech companies need to take when dealing with um, with uh, with um, harmful content and 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 in particular um, cyber violence against women. Um, I mean, it's it's a, it's a more general question, but bearing in mind what we had uh, have said before, and the fact that the scale of this problem is increasing, and added to that, that the companies are 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 looking towards implement uh, um, using AI and and, and different types of um, algorithms to deal with content. I think it is absolutely necessary to have the the oversight of the procedures and of the tools that are implemented to deal with the with the um, with the uh, requests uh, made by made by users thanks a lot uh, uh, say any other comments on the dsa issue I would just love to echo what was being previously previously said, and especially what um, Asha said as well, that online abuse needs to be recognised as disproportionately affecting women through an intersectional lens that particularly recognises uh, minoritised communities across Europe. Um, we need to see that when online abuse, is, online abuse is mentioned in the bill, that it mentions that it's part of a continuum of violence against women. A lot of the recommendations from um, uh, uh, UN conventions around um, violence against women talk about and recommend there being a joined up approach and a joined up strategy when it comes to violence against women. For us in the UK and similar concerns for the DSA bill, we're not seeing that joined up approach with other forms of um, legislation that meant to be tackling violence against women. And again we're, we're basically perpetuating the issue that we've been trying to fight against is making women's issue a separate issue women's issue should be um, interwoven into all legislation and not seen as a sidelined piece or a group of people you consult with after you've already decided what you're going to do and the last um, thing we'd like to see is digital citizenship education education being part of the part of the legislation around prevention a rule rules and obligations of tech companies to help prevent the abuse in the first place so that actually you don't even need to go through um enforcement and 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 regulation of how they've enacted the um how they've responded to the abuse on the platform because they have been working so much to prevent it through digital digital citizenship education lens Thank you. Uh, I think that we uh, can all agree that the DSA is a great opportunity for us to fight uh, with the gender-based cyber uh, uh, violence. And uh, um, I have one more, a bit tricky uh, question. Uh, the question is, should you not involve men in this fight? So, who would like to add something, girls, about the role of men? I think it is crucial. I am asked this question every single time on a panel. Yes, men can do it, but why do women need to tell men what to do? We are women that have come within. I'm saying this loud. So I hope my boyfriend can hear. We are women that we, we are women that um, are that have seen the problem, taken the initiative, organised. Ash has been working with you guys on this very topic in this bill and these recommendations for three years. It's not now involving men when we're almost at the begin at the finish line to come and try and take credit. No, it's men deciding, okay, there is a problem, there's a pipeline of, of white men particularly being radicalized online. Go and clean up your own mess because then that would leave us with less things to be dealing with. So yes, I'm all about involving men in the battle, but not in our not in our funding applications, not in our grants, not in our hustle to try and get people to understand this topic for the last four years. Men are, have a huge role to play in active bystander interventions, but I do not think it's the role of women, particularly black women, yet again, to do the emotional labor to teach you how to not be inappropriate online. I really hope that all men uh, can hear you, actually. Asha, do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, I think Shay said it perfectly. Um, we often get asked this question in these spaces. And um, I think 
there's always two points that I mentioned, right? That patriarchy impacts on all of us negatively. It affects women and girls, men and boys in a negative way, and we need to eradicate the patriarchy. But asking us in regards to how to, in, in to involve these other groups when this is impacting on us is leaving a lot of the emotional labor on us to not only be the ones experiencing this, advocating against this, supporting women civil society organizations from grassroots to frontline service providers to individual human rights defenders um, to be able to combat this issue, but at the same time, trying to convince our political frameworks and political institutions that they have to do something from both a legislative and political point of view, and then also have to answer the question about how we bring other people along to something that is very clearly a human rights violation. Um, and to put it quite frankly, it's, it's, you know, it's a lot to request. Um, so I think just recognizing um, that we should have fair democracies, a fair society, that everyone should be able to participate equally and safely means that their participation should be driven by themselves, but also to be able to listen to the experts and for us to say, this is the issue. Okay, you're coming along with us because you're you're coming along with us, not because we are dragging you there with us too. So yeah, that's those, those normally my answers to that particular question. Susanna, would you like to add something about the role of men? Well, I, I, I totally agree with what, what was said. I, I just want to um, maybe mention something which, which I find particularly, um, well, uh, annoying maybe. Um, I think we, when we talk about preventing and, and, and combating violence against women, we often um, uh, focus on what, the, what people experiencing violence should do, and, and particularly when we deal with um, cyber violence, a lot is being said on, on how women should uh, act or what should react to, to violence they experience or to harassment they're experiencing. And, and it was also shown in the interviews we did with, with, uh, with women in Poland who experienced the violence that they have to, um, that the onus of responsibility of taking action is, is on them. And uh, they are often alone in that in that process, and they and they often are forced to go back to the to the content that is um, that is um, um, uh, that is offensive and 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 uh, and deal with it again. So I think there's a huge role to play for other people involved um, involved in all this and and people observers and bystanders as has been said but once again you should not respect you should not expect uh, people experiencing violence um, to tell uh, the, the 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 bystanders what they should do it should really come from from the from uh, the initiative com should com come from different sources to give support and to create the network uh, of support uh and uh, and yeah i think it's it's absolutely cr crucial um to 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 remember about the the role of other actors in, in, in all this not only of people experiencing violence may i just say though anna if the men want to get involved you can donate you've saved a lot of money not getting your beers and not getting your coffees over the last of over the last 13 months and for some areas in Europe you're you're backing the lockdown apologies for that but money can be donated glitch is a charity um becoming a regular donor to charities across Europe allows us to make long-term change. We've had a change. We've had a conversation today that shows that this bill cycle, these things that we're calling for can't happen overnight. They're going to take long-term planning and long-term work. And the one thing you can do is to help resource that by becoming a regular donor. And the second thing is help amplify it, help amplify, it. talk about this and share this with your network. And the third thing that I've seen my boyfriend do really well um, is in football groups, particularly just challenging the kind of aggressive behavior around around sports professionals when they're playing, challenging the kind of the, that line of what is accountability and what stems into abusive behavior. Getting men to just challenge, when we've been calling men to challenge sexual harassment and misogyny, the next bit is men challenging online misogyny as well. So those are my three things. Donate, part with your cash, amplify and challenge. Thanks a lot. Actually, this is a very good advice and uh, recommendation. Uh, so actually, we have no more questions. Uh, so 
uh, thank you very much uh, for all the questions and especially uh, for all the answers. I can assure you that uh, all your ideas and su suggestions will be used by us to, to, to create a, a world free of uh, uh, cyber violence. I'm more than sure than that uh, both uh, MEP uh, Dr. Sylvia Spurek and MEP uh, Van Sparentak will not uh, remain passive on uh, that uh, issue. And uh, uh, this is my, my pleasure to, to, to give the floor to MEP Kim Van Sparentak for the closing um, remarks. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much for the very, very interesting uh, panel. I, uh, I think uh, me and many of the other viewers um, have learned a lot um, about you know, the extent of the problem, but also um, how we can actually solve it and uh, how we actually need a very intersectional perspective and as many uh, people from uh, different groups in society to be involved. Um, I guess after this discussion, we, we can still with all our hearts say that women should feel safe offline and online. It's heartbreaking to know that during this pandemic, violence against women and femicide has risen. And as we all stayed at home and our communications moved online, online too, women experienced a rise in online hate, doxing, stalking, sexual intimidation, revenge porn and threats. And this is especially true for women of color and women with a public function. And this is not about a handful of people sending an angry or nasty tweet. It's a structural problem. And next to that, we see online groups with hundreds of members created specifically for organizing and targeting hate campaigns at chosen, often female victims. And online hate can lead to offline intimidation and violence too. For example, when the phone numbers, places of work or home addresses of the victims are shared publicly. Online violence towards women has a huge impact on their feeling of safety and their mental health. And it can also invade their privacy, destroy their self-esteem, personal relationships or damage their careers. And the aim of online hate and violence against women is so clear. We, they just want women to be silenced and it works. More and more women are scared to post their opinions online, scared of a wave of hate as a reaction. And we see this especially the case with young women. And this is a huge problem because our online debate increasingly takes place online. Online hate discourages women to participate in the public debate and has also increasingly become a reason mentioned for not running in elections. This way, online violence against women directly strikes at the heart of our democracy. We need to take serious action because we cannot speak of equality if women cannot participate freely and safely in our public debates. Reporting violence or intimidation against women to the police is already often difficult and authorities lack the capacity to act. But if you want to have online hate removed, you're completely dependent on the platform where the hate takes place. And these platforms often do not react to notices of intimidation, threats or revenge porn. This leaves women who are a victim of cyber violence empty handed. And the solution is not to make platforms responsible for everything that appears online, because this would only strengthen the role of online platforms as referees of our public debates and leaves the victims into their hands as well. Increasing platforms responsibility for everything that appears online would in practice oblige platform to filter everything before it appears online and simply delete any content that they're unsure of or find undesirable. And these filters often don't recognize context, nuance or humor. And this leads to over deletion and endangers our freedom of expression. And we should not want to put the power over our freedom of expression and free internet in the hands of private companies. But we do need to find ways to solve gender-based violence online. And in the upcoming Digital Services Act, we therefore need to find a good balance between ensuring that gender-based cyber violence is taken offline, whereas perfectly legal content remains online. And this means that for a free and safe internet, we need clear rules on how platforms should handle notices of cyber violence. 
First, platforms must be obliged to reply as soon as possible and not leave women with the feeling that their notices are not taken seriously. Secondly, platforms must clearly explain why they leave something up or take something down. The, this creates transparency and gives victims something to act upon. Because thirdly, users should have easy and fast access to a judge or an independent dispute resolution body when they is, disagree with the platform. And where it is unclear if something is illegal, a judge should decide. This way, we take decisions out of the hands of private companies that profit from hate and place it firmly back into the hands of democratic institutions. But only focusing on the online world is not enough. As my colleague Sylvia already said before, to make this system work, we need to make sure that gender-based cyber violence is clearly defined and illegal in the entire EU. The Commission has said they will propose legislation this year to include specific forms of gender-based violence under EU listed crimes. Today's event has made clear why it is important to have cyber violence included in this list. We urgently need action on an EU level and no more empty words. This is why we need a directive on gender-based violence that includes cyber violence. We cannot solve this pressing issue with less binding forms of legislation. And as Asha and Sey said, we need both in the DSA and the Directive on Gender-Based Violence to form a synergy in our fight against cyber violence. Also, we need public authorities to take serious action. We need national contact points where victims of online hate can go for psychological and legal help. And where many forms of online hate already fall under criminal law, national authorities need to bring perpetrators to court. These solutions can empower women and, and ensure victims of gender-based cyber violence are heard. We will not be silenced. We can only speak of true democracy if women can freely and safely participate in any public debate. And in the European Union, all women should feel safe, both offline and online. Thank you very much. And I think I will now give the floor to my colleague, uh, Sylvia, for the final remarks. Uh, well, I think uh, our final remarks is just to end gender-based violence. And thank you again, all guests, participants, uh, and all that uh, uh, could uh, uh, observe our discussions and uh, we will for sure use all your comments uh, in drafting uh, uh, our position, Euro uh, European Parliament position uh, on the draft of the directive on gender-based violence. So thank you very much again. Uh, we have a lot of uh, food uh, for thoughts uh, right now. Uh, thank you again to my team uh, for organizing this uh, seminar, to the staff of Greens, uh, of Greens FA uh, political group, and to my colleague, colleague um, uh, MEP Fan uh, Sparentak, uh, for joining me in organi organizing this uh, event. Thank you, and this is closing remarks. Thank you, stay healthy, stay safe.